and Brene Pierders. Um, so my talk is going to be on smooth moves, um, and it might feel a bit out of place because it was planned for another session. Um, uh, but because it focuses on a selection uh, mechanism that moves away from pointing, hopefully you find it uh, interesting. And thanks again for accommodating my talk at the end of your, at the end of your session. So my work includes uh, myself, of course, from Edinburgh Napier, uh, David from Eindhoven, and Ian and his students from Ulsan in South Korea. Um, so I think we can all agree that augmented reality glasses uh, are rapidly maturing technology. Um, I would also say we can agree that it's quite still very unclear what's the best way for interact with AR contents and interfaces. Um, current and viable input modalities for head-mounted displays includes onset touch, um, here used for text entry. So the Google Glass here is not exactly AR, but the example is still quite good. Uh, you can also interact with mid-air mid gestures, um, such as projected AR, uh, or using wearables, such as gloves um, or your belt. Quite uh, interesting approaches. Um, and finally, you can also use clickers uh, or proxy devices, um, such as your mouse. So this is a screenshot from the Meta 2 AR uh, glass. Uh, and while these solutions are really, really interesting, uh, many smart glasses focus in augmenting in a, a primary physical task, which can at times uh, fully engage your hands or the user's hands. And many of these, um, in many of these examples you see here, the head-mounted display ends up serving just as a play playback device, not really as an interactive uh, device. As such, a more practical and appealing approach to interaction with AR is by tracking the user's eyes or head's uh, movements. Uh, not only do, they, do the hands remain free, um, but all sensing can be integrated into the, into the head-mounted display. Well, the problem with this approach is that it requires explicit confirmation mechanism to trigger a selection. That is, you know where the user is looking, um, but not when the user actively wants to interact with what's in front of them. Uh, a common approach, uh, approach to this problem is to dwell, um, which enables you to select a target by simply focusing your gaze on it uh, for a short amount of time. Google calls it fuse, I believe. Um, but the drawback of this approach is, is sort of a lack of precision and a fixed time cost. And these quotes are from the developer websites um, for both the Meta 2 uh, VR headsets and the Google Cardboard headsets. Uh, another approach to triggering selections um, is just using speech. Uh, you can do the HoloLens. Um, but again, the drawbacks of this approach is that it's a bit obtrusive, um, especially in shared work environments. Um, and can be hard to capture in noisy environments such as in a factory floor. So this is not mine. You can get the reference there in the bottom. So someone else is doing this. Uh, this is from someone else's work. Um, to address these uh, selection, selection limitations, our paper follows a recent body of work that looks at gaze input systems based on smooth pursuits eye movements to trigger selections. Um, smooth pursuits are distinctive, uh, continuous, low, low latency adjustments to gaze that are naturally produced only when visually tracking a moving object. Um, smooth pursuit systems operate by showing, a user, uh, by showing a user a set of moving targets while tracking gaze, uh, and statistical matching between gaze and the target trajectories is used to infer which target the user is attending to. Um, and there are two main advantages to this type of uh, input mechanism. First, instead of relying on a set of predefined gestures or speech commands that the user needs to learn and memorize, each control uh, encodes the necessary input information in their singular uh, movement. Uh, the second advantage is that because they operate on movement, not position, Smooth Pursuit's interfaces are rel relatively immune to target size. Um, if the user can see a target and track it, uh, they can actually interact with it. So you can imagine this same interface here if the red, green, and purple were quite small, as long as their trajectory is quite distinct, the user could still interact with them. So the size becomes uh, less relevant. And we used this um, in a previous work uh, on orbits that was presented here uh, two years ago, and basically we used this advantage of, 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 of target size to uh, create a hands-free interaction technique that enables you to interact with very tiny targets on a smartwatch interface. Um, but in AR interfaces, uh, it could also be used to interact with faraway targets, like the sort of lamp that you see in the far, uh, which could be hard to select with pointing, to sort of, just sort of following this Fitz law um, uh, tradition. Um, and because you only look at movements, uh, uh, we can also have controls that overlap in 2D space, such as these two hanging lamps, again, which could be hard to select with pointing because they're overlapping each other. Uh, finally, Smooth Pursuit's input is robust against tracking inaccuracies. Capturing changes in gaze is much simpler than accurately determining where someone is looking at. Um, and also, we don't need to go through this sort of tedious calibration process to map the user's gaze to, to a display. 
But there are also several limitations to smooth pursuits input. First, the wearable eye trackers are rather expensive. Uh, you can see here two, ex two examples. One is the Pupil Pro, uh, and these are already the cheapest sort of ver versions of these. So this is already the, the Pupil Pro uh, that you can add on to a whole lens, and on the bottom you have EOG glasses, uh, which compute eye movements um, using pairs of electrodes um, instead of cameras. And the second uh, limitation is the form factor. So the eye trackers require cameras or electrodes to be placed at very specific locations on the user's face. Uh, with the former also requiring a, a clear line of sight to the user's eyes. Uh, and of course optical systems are also susceptible to changing light conditions such as those that occur when using AR outdoors. And at the same time when we were doing the this user studies for orbits, we noticed that at times the system would stop working and this was because the user was actually started following the targets with their heads instead of their eyes. Um, and this is because uh, gaze is a, the inseparable product of eye and, and head movements, uh, of head and eye movements, sorry. And the relationship between head and eye um, is quite uh, sophisticated. So at the most basic level, uh, the VOR continuously stabil stabilizes gaze by adjusting, basically inverting eye position in response to head position, or changes, uh, in response to changes in head position. In contrast, during smooth pursuits, uh, tracking of moving objects, the eye and head move together to keep the object op op opti optimally in view. So we thought that we could actually track the head instead of the eyes during smooth pursuits type movements. Uh, we could address many of the limitations of wearable eye trackers for AR. Uh, so head movements can be tracked with the IMUs, which uh, measure rotations along three axes you see here, quite straightforward. Um, and there are several advantages, as you can imagine, to these types of, of sensors in, compar uh, in comparison to optical tracking. First is the form factor. So the IMUs can be placed anywhere on the head or, or smart glasses. They're quite small and light, so you can embed them into many headworn items, such as jewelry or headphones. Um, furthermore, these sensors are already embedded in most AR and VR headsets already. So in this talk, uh, we just, I'm just going to go over the, our four contributions, which are smooth moves, which is an input technique for AR that relies on rotation data from head-mounted motion sensors that enables users to select targets by smooth pursuits type head movements. Uh, we also present three studies, a uh, comparison of head movements to an eye tracking baseline across a, uh, a range of target moving conditions, uh, performance differences between handheld and head mounted um, uh, based AR using smooth moves, and a qualitative user study of AR, um, of an AR system for smart home control, and more specifically a smart lights um, control. So uh, our work is heavily influenced by prior smooth pursuits and traction techniques, uh, but it replaces the use of eye coordinates on a plane or display by yaw and pitch data from the IMU. Again, quite, quite straightforward. If the Pearson's correlation between a target's X and Y and the user's uh, yaw and pitch are both higher than 0 0.8, the target is selected. Very, again, very simple and straightforward. Uh, visually, smooth moves uh, closely mimics our early work on, on, on orbits. Um, a graphical control uh, is comprised of a trajectory around the center point. In case of AR, the center point could be a physical object that you want to control or a smart device you want to control. And then you have one or more targets that continuously traverse this trajectory, as you can see here in the video. And target disambiguation is achieved in two ways. First, targets move in different phases, as you see in the video. And you can also have them move clockwise and counterclockwise. Uh, so let's go over the first study quite quickly. Um, so we captured uh, both eye and head movement data in three conditions that you see uh, here. So this is basically what you told participants to track things naturally, to track things with their eyes and track things with their, with their heads. Eye data was captured using the Pupil Pro you see here uh, that the participant is using. Um, and as with other smooth pursuit input systems, no calibration was, was performed. Head data was captured using a nine axis IMU that you see positioned there on the, the edge of the, the pair of glasses. And we use Mahoney's filters to extract the on pitch, uh, pitch values. Um, participants always started in a natural condition, but then we counterbalanced the other two conditions. And they would see the, the moving targets on an on a external display, the position around 60 centimeters from them. Uh, we recruited 18 participants who completed 432 trials each. Um, each possible trial combination occurred once for each of the three main experimental conditions. Uh, the targets varied uh, size, they varied uh, trajectory visibility, so we would show targets with a line or without the line that shows the trajectory. Speed type, direction type, speed type, targets would speed up halfway to the trial. A direction type, um, targets would move in an opposite direction halfway through the trial. Um, we ran correlations between the all eye and head data in the three experimental conditions using different window sizes. Uh, these results indicate participants follow the target more naturally with their eyes and their heads. 
uh, which is not particularly sort of, uh, it's quite expected, I guess. Uh, but the data from the head condition, however, shows that head-based tracking can be readily achievable by participants uh, with even better performance. And that the head correlation uh, coefficients were higher than for the eyes in any of the target conditions, as you see in the table uh, here. Again, you can see all this in the paper in more detail, of course. Um, the, the results were also uh, uniform across eyes and head conditions. Basically, smaller trajectories were harder, and tar tar targets that changed directions halfway through, uh, through the trial. So they're, they're basically, they were the hardest one to, to select. Um, finally, we also looked at the scale of head movements, uh, which is quite different from, the, from eye movements, um, and which can impact a range of factors such as, uh, such as obtrusiveness, um, social acceptability, and long-term comfort with the technique. Uh, so you see here some heat maps for the trials that I've highlighted um, in black. Uh, and participants, you can see in line one, exaggerated the head movement for smaller trajectories and modestly reduced them for larger trajectories. Um, it, these are the means. If you look at medians, the head movement can be very subtle. For the smallest trajectories, he median head rotations were just 6.7 degrees. Um, so we believe these movements are sufficiently small to ensure the technique is discrete and not very, very fatiguing to use. Um, so on to study two quite quickly. Uh, we calculated also error rates and acquisition times in two conditions, the head-mounted display condition, which, in which users were using the Epson Movario AR glasses, and the uh, handheld the display, which used the Nexus 6P, which is a more common AR system if you think of sort of Pokemon Go and all these new AR applications you can get on your phone. Um, so these were, again, counterbalanced across participants, and in both cases, participants wore the same hand-mounted IMU that we showed in the first study. Um, we recruited 16 participants who completed 192 trials each. Uh, we re-examined trajectory size as we were shown to impact performance in the first study and added target cardinality as a condition. Uh, shape was equally distributed um, amongst target cardinality and the remaining variables were constant. So we didn't change speed type and direction type um, anymore. Uh, and participants were simply asked to uh, track the target in red which was chosen at random. Um, so onto the results, error rates increase with target cardinality, which is not particularly surprising. So the more targets you have, the harder they are to select. Uh, if we exclude targets with very small trajectories um, and interfaces with over six targets, we report a mean error rate of 2.6 for the glasses and 4.9 for the phone. Uh, and if you compare this with similar hands-free approaches, it's quite, quite uh, good uh, results. Uh, the acquisition times are around two seconds um, and will only negatively affected by smaller trajectories. Uh, these two seconds also include a half a second uh, at the start where no correlation was calculated to minimize false positives doing visual search. Uh, and again, these results are also quite positive if you compare it to similar approaches. So in summary, the results of the study confirmed that smooth moves uh, targeting works well in two different AR scenarios and in fact may be, might be particularly suitable for head-mounted displays. This is useful as these systems already have all the required sensors to support the technique. So we conclude with the design um, and evaluation of a prototype that uses AR for displaying moving controls around the Philips Hue smart lights as sm and smooth moves for inputs um, captured using a normal HoloLens with no modification. Uh, we use smart lights but could have used any other um, smart device that could benefit from an AR interface. Um, so the motivation for the, 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 pro the, the prototype um, uh, you can see on the right. And the idea of the prototype is really, really simple. So you see 2D moving controls displayed in space in proximity to the lights they control or in proximity to the device they control. Um, these positions are set once using predefined images or real world objects. So you can tag your lights and then these, these uh, controls will show. Um, the controls enable the user to turn the lights on or off as you've seen in the video playing or they can access preset light schemes like a cool energizing light or like a warm relaxing, uh, relaxing light. Um, these controls also enable the user to change the intensity of the lights uh, and to scroll through different hue colors using continuous head movement. So the plus, minus, and the RGB logo, if you just follow them, you adjust the intensity or the, the color. And we recruited 10 participants, uh, and we, we had this lab study that took uh, over uh, 30 minutes for, with each participant and was based on a participatory design technique to elicit in-depth user feedback. Um, in general, participants responded positively to the technique, trying this clever, minimalist, um, there were some concerns over selection times or the technique initially required some concentration, but some of these participants then got, got better at, at, at the task quite, quite quickly as well. Um, participants also appreciated the simplicity of the interface. They can see themselves using it in home or work-related tasks that occupy both hands. 
Uh, they also mention accessibility for as a, as a use case. It could be quite quite useful as well. Um, it could also f it, some participants also felt that it could be easily integrated with other input modalities, such as using coarse gestures to bring up the movement. So you don't ha you don't want to have a smart room that has all of these mov movements always on. So you could just use a coarse gesture to start to uh, turn off the, the system, or using speech to provide more detailed instructions when needed. Uh, so this is definitely interesting future work that we we want to look into. Um, and again, participants prefer discrete over continuous input, reflecting this general idea that smooth moves is more suited for quick and direct uh, interaction. Uh, and finally, the most interesting quotes are this relationship between eyes and head is, is sort of what, what makes gaze. Uh, and these, the quotes you see here, it sort of reinforced the idea that gaze is a combination of eyes and head motion. And uh, for seven, several participants, even with the instruction to move their heads, these modalities were hard to separate and distinguish. Uh, some of the feedbacks, such as doing it with my mind, is something, it's something we find often when people are describing eye tracking experiences, for example. So I was left wondering if the results from this first study where the data, head data was so poor in the natural condition were simply be due to the protocol we chose to, to use. The, the fact that users know they were using an eye tracker, even if we told them just to follow a target without mentioning the eyes or the head, the fact they were using an eye tracker could have conditioned um, their behavior somehow. So, in conclusion, so that we can all have coffee, uh, Smooth Moves was well received by participants. Um, it was viewed as convenient, relaxing, and well suited for quick interactions in hands free situations, and was also deemed unobtrusive. Uh, in contrast with Smooth Pursuit's input systems based on eye tracking, uh, Smooth Moves can be immediately implemented on a wide range of devices that feature embedded motion sensing, such as most AR and VR um, headsets. Um, I'm going to open for questions, but I understand if you guys want to rush for coffee. I'll, I'm going to stay behind a little bit, so if anyone wants to chat, I will just be here while the video plays in the background. Thank you. Uh, Eyal Ofik from uh, MSR. Uh, how do you avoid false positives because those motion attracts the eye and you tend to follow them even without thinking of selection? Um, yeah, that's a very good point. So um, this is something we were very careful when we design a purely eye-based system in which the, the, the target information would be at the core and then the controls would be sort of orbiting around the control. So that there is this two step of actually reading the center piece that has no sort of uh, actionable uh, information and then opting to look at the, at the, at the motion. But that's one of the, the, the challenges here is, is movement attracts the eyes. That's how we evolved. Um, and how to train people. And I think that's reflecting one of the comments where people say it would be really great if I could use coarse gestures just to bring all this movement up and then I can actually bring it down because I, I really can't cope with, with, with these things. Even though some people find it calming at some point, uh, it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is one of the challenges, definitely. Uh, and I think it's, it's, these studies al always reflect a very narrow experience. People come in the lab and they experience this for the first time over an hour. Um, so it would be definitely interesting to see if people can cope to, to learn with, to sort of learn how to cope with movement a bit better and to, to avoid triggering things when, when they know that it could trigger uh, something. Um, I have a quick question. So, how could you do you know how you can, how short this you can reduce the selection time? So, you said that the selection time is around two two seconds, right? Is there a way to make it uh, smaller? So, this is uh, why when we did the first study, we had um, uh, we looked at different window sizes yeah, to see all all, 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 all sort of all, all, all little data you can use to. Uh, and again, one second is quite a standard across other similar approaches, and it seemed to work um, okay. well. So it's a compromise again. Uh, okay, very good. Thank you.